Hi, this is Quick Analysis and Revision of Carol Andolfi's The Good Teachers. One well, of the first things we need to recognise is the poem's written in the present tense, and uh, we'll have to consider why she's chosen to do so, particularly given that the poem's almost like a building's room, and it charts the growth of an individual from when they're young at primary school right up to uh, when they're an adult. Um, so it seems strange when it's reflective to use the present tense. It's also written in the second person, so rather than a dramatic monologue written in the first person, here we constantly get these references to you, and we'll see later perhaps why that's the case. If we take a look at the first stanza, one of the first references we get is to you run round the back to be in it again. Now, we're maybe not familiar with this nowadays, but um, certainly in my youth, when we had school photos taken, you would use a panoramic camera, which would start filming over here and gradually scan across all the students until it got to the end. And then you'd end up with a nice long shot like this that got all of the school in. That's what Duff is referring to. And one of the little exciting things that you could do when a panoramic photo was being taken is, if you're on the far left-hand side, over here, you could wait and smile and have your photo taken, but when the camera's just gone off you, you could leg it around the back, get to the other side of the photograph, and then stand and smile again, and you would be in the photograph in two different places. So, you run around the back to be in it again. There's that childlike joy and excitement in being able to do this process, and we'll come back to another reason why that might be significant in a moment. No bigger than your thumbs, those virtuous women, and the virtuous women could be referring to nuns because Duffy herself went to a Catholic primary school and it could be a reference to nuns generally in education, size you up from the front row. Well, the teachers traditionally in these photographs are in the front row, but I think we've got um, an interesting uh, metaphor being used here as well because we get a sense of Duffy's, well, the poetic voices, um, thumb being placed up in front of the photograph to see if she can place it over the image of the teacher so that she's literally sizing up the teacher, checking the size of the teacher there. But also metaphorically sizing up is a reference to working out or assessing an individual so she's both literally sizing up by checking the size of the individual against her thumb, but also you know, assessing them, judging them in a way. You breathe on the glass, making a ghost of her. Um, this metaphor of making a ghost of her is clearly a reference to breathing on glass. Now, it's unclear whether that glass is the glass of... Um, the door of a classroom, or whether it's the glass in front of the photograph. But either way, the image of that teacher is obscured by the fogging uh, created by the breath. And I wonder whether there's a sense of the power of the individual being created there. She has the capacity, just as she has the capacity to cover a teacher with her form, she also has the capacity to obscure a teacher by breathing on the glass as well. And there must be some profound sense of their own um, empowerment by being able to do that. It also, of course, conveys this idea of mist very effectively, the idea of uh, making a ghost. We then get this weird final line of the stanza, South Sea Bubble Defenestration of Prague. And certainly I wasn't particularly well versed in these historical references. Um, the South Sea Bubble refers to this quite obscure economic situation um, that are related to the South Sea Company in 1720. And the defenestration of Prague referred to two governors of Prague being thrown out of a window. Uh, it happened twice, but the main one being in 1618. Not the kind of historical um, events that you would traditionally find students learning. And they're not separated. It's not South Sea Bubble, full stop, defenestration of Prague. The two are kind of commingled, they're pushed together. And I wonder whether that's conveying that the individual incidents aren't significant. They, they have no real meaning for the poetic voice at this time. Really, it's not the events that are remarkable. It's the words. South Sea Bubble. It's just a lovely phrase, South Sea Bubble. You've got the sibilance running through South Sea. You've got that um, predominance of plosives in bubble. Um, and then defenestration. You know, a really wonderful low-frequency word that just sounds almost magical. So that the words themselves 
create magic. The words themselves are, are what generate the interest for the student, not the meaning that lies behind them. In the second stanza, we move on to Miss Piri. You love Miss Piri so much. You're top of her class so much you need two of you to stare out from the year. Now that's taking us back to that image from the first stanza. You need two of you to stare out from the year, the two of you in the picture created in the panorama. We've also got clearly repetition here as well, um, perhaps representing the intensity of her love and admiration. Um, perhaps that um, love, the intensity of that love, is also captured in the fact that she appears twice in the picture. She seems to explicitly identify the manifestation of the love with her appearance in the picture twice. The River's Tale by Rudyard Kipling, by heart. Uh, Rudyard Kipling is a frequently taught poet, but what I think is interesting is the choice of poem. Um, the River's Tale is essentially a kind of buildings Roman about the River Thames, the way the River Thames was formed and its progress and development. So in a sense you could say it parallels the kind of development and progress, the kind of buildings Roman that's being presented in this poem as well. I'm going to end by arguing that uh, this really isn't a poem about teachers, this is a poem about life. Um, this final phrase by heart is interesting as well in terms of its ambiguity. When we read it in the context of the whole line, it seems that it means learning the river's tale by Rudyard Kipling in its entirety, learning it by rote. But, of course, by heart also has symbolic significance. The heart symbolises love. And given the context of this stanza, it seems appropriate to recognise that she's learned the whole of the river's tale because of her love for Miss Piri. A kind, intelligent green eye. A cruel blue one. Now, we've got a kind of awkward antithetical parallelism going on here, which could represent the kind of contrasting aspects of Miss Piri, that she's both intelligent and kind, and yet also cruel. It seems strange, given that she loves Miss Piri so much, to have this cruelty identified with her. And so we need to think about how we could reconcile that. I'm not sure. I wondered whether it meant that she was both loving and firm. Perhaps cruel um, is... You know, a strange term to apply in the context of someone you love, but it could ex express you know, an extreme emotional response, the kind of extreme emotional response you, you tend to get from a very young child. You know, it, it's, I hate this, I love this, and it's that extremity of emotion that's perhaps represented by the choice of the word cruel. When we move on to the next stanza, uh, but not Miss Sheridan, common view appelé, but not Miss Appleby, equal to the square of the other two sides, never Miss Webb, Dar es Salaam, Kilimanjaro. We get this pattern established of giving the name of the teacher, followed by the thing that's uh, taught. Um, negativities attached to every one of those elements, suggesting there were a lot of these disliked teachers. The good teachers. Now, by this stage, we've probably recognised that the term good teachers is ironic. Um, teachers aren't universally good, and certainly for um, the poetic voice, it seems as if there are, there are good teachers like Miss Perry, but there are also ones that she almost despises. The good teachers swish down the corridor, and it's that word swish I want to focus on. It means to move with a hissing sound, and it's generally applied to the swishing of a whip or a cane, now, the cane would be a particularly appropriate um, choice in this context because, of course, um, uh, Duffy's writing about a period when corporal punishment was still used. It was possible to hit students with a cane. Um, you've got clear sibilant sounds within it, reinforcing that kind of whipping or caning noise. But it could also re refer to effeminate movement. And I think that might be appropriate here as well, particularly what, when we get uh, the further description of the good teachers. Because... It, it could contrast the way in which the good teachers present themselves in contrast to the virtuous teachers, the nuns, from um, early in the poem. We see it here, really. Snobbish and proud and clean and qualified. That polysyndetic list. And I'm going to argue that the polysyndeton here kind of unifies the elements. It draws them all together. It also helps to convey the kind of disdain for, that she holds for each element on that list. You'd normally think of clean and qualified as being positive things,
But here, the fact that they're yoked to snobbish and proud undermines their positivity, makes them negative as well. Um, it seems as if the poetic voice is pointing out that these aren't ways of defining a truly good teacher. It doesn't matter if they're clean. It doesn't even matter if they're qualified. The nuns in the primary school probably wouldn't have been qualified, but they could have been caring. They could have been kind. They could have engaged. As we move on to the third stanza, we get this um, way in which the poetic voice, the poetic voice's voice, is confused with the voice of the good teachers. And they've got your number. You roll the waistband of your skirt over and over, all leg, all dumb insolence, smoke rings. You won't pass. You could do better. But there's the wall you climb into dancing love by its marriage, the Cheltenham and Gloucester today, the day you'll be sorry one day. It's clear that these highlighted phrases are phrases that she's heard teachers delivering to her. Um, and what I would argue, and one of the reasons why I think the um, second person pronoun's been used, is that um, it kind of obscures the distinction between the poetic voice and the voice of these good teachers. And one of the effects of that is to give the sense that the student is accepting their fate. The students heard, you won't pass, and they respond to that. They, they fail because they've been told they're going to fail. And we can't tell if it's the teacher's voice or their own because we're so used to you being used to refer to the I of the poetic voice, but also it's being used to refer to the language employed by the teacher talking to the poetic voice. You roll the waistband of your skirt over and over, or leg, or dumb insolence, smoke rings. Um, that repetition perhaps could reflect the repeated rebellious efforts being made by the poetic voice. And here we've clearly got a sense of time having moved on. Despite the fact we're still in the present tense, time has moved on. We've got these acts of rebellion being linked to aspects of sexuality, of aspects of independence, maturity. Uh, smoking is often conducted by the young to give a sense of their age. Um, and they're ostentatious displays. They're reinforcing a sense of self, a sense of independence, a cutting off from youth, which is going to be a significant thing for Duffy towards the end of the poem. But there's the wall you climb. Um, the wall you climb is clearly a metaphor, and I'd argue that it's potentially a metaphor for ageing, the ageing process, that building's Roman again. Um, these stages of maturing are at first exciting, you know, dancing, love bites, and then we start to move into independence being lost, and moving into marriage in the Cheltenham and Gloucester. And it's the Cheltenham and Gloucester that I think is the particularly important and interesting thing here. Um, the fact that she's chosen a parochial building society. It's not like the nationwide or you know, a national company. The Cheltenham and Gloucester, while it's widespread, has its roots in the parochial, in local areas. And that might give that sense of um, the fate of the individual being locked to the parochial, being very narrow-minded, very limited, very isolated. And I'd also argue that the asyndetic nature of this structure also, you know, helps to convey the inevitability of the fate of the indiv individual. It's naturally moving from one to the next. Dancing Love Bites marriage to Cheltenham and Gloucester. It's almost inevitable. It's, it's non-stop. It doesn't even stop for that conjunction. Uh, we're not sure whether she works for the Cheltenham and Gloucester or she's just mortgaged to them in buying a house. But either way, she's kind of shackled to that institution. There's, there's real pathos, I think, here that, you know, by the time we get to this stage of the poem, as we get to the end of the poem, we've reached a point where we've gone from the enthusiasm and excitement of that young child who is running around the back of the panoramic photo to someone who's accepted their fate as yoked to the Cheltenham and Gloucester. Hence, I don't think it's a poem about teachers, really. I do think it's a poem about life and the way in which, if we're not careful, life can become that kind of inevitable treadmill of drudgery where... The self is lost and you are shackled to an institution or a way of living. Okay, thanks.